and welcome to the Cardinals Nest. This is the show where we interview coaches or student athletes at St. Mary's University to get caught up on all of the respective sports. I'm Dean Beckman, the faculty athletics representative for St. Mary's. My co-host on the Cardinals Nest is Donnie Netto, the sports information director. Men's hockey coach Ryan Egan is joining us today on the Cardinals Nest. And Ryan, thanks so much for being on the show today. And uh, Donnie, this is year number two for Ryan, right? And so uh, good to have yet another experienced uh, head coach back with us at St. Mary's. Absolutely. And Ryan, I just have one request from you. And that is yeah. don't talk too loud because it reverberates from the office right next door. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not to. I'll, I'll try not to. But no, thanks for having me, guys. I'm excited to be back on. Well, Ryan, I think maybe that's a good place to start. Year number two here as head coach for St. Mary's. And uh, little did you know that at the end of last year, we would start a global pandemic, right? <laughs> uh, so not exactly the way you wanted uh, your first year to end, but at least for the most part, uh, your team got through the bulk of the season uh, before the spring sports had to get canceled. So maybe just kind of recap year one for us and, and how you feel it went uh, taking over the head coaching duties for St. Mary's. Yeah, it, it was an interesting year for sure. I think we, I wasn't really sure what to expect. I knew that coming in, um, there were going to be some small philosophical changes just in my brand of hockey versus the brand, brand of hockey that was played previously. Um, I think the transition went pretty well. I, I was very happy with the hockey that we played last year. I don't think as many games went our way as we probably deserved. Um, but that was, again, part of being year one, part of a new system, part of um, a new coach and, and a lot of other factors as well. You know, the highlight of the season, obviously, was the fact that we did go out east and, and won a, a very, uh, we'll say, prestigious tournament. And I think we were able to send off our seniors with that memory. And I'm, I'm extremely happy for that, for the seniors. Um, but looking back, I think we failed on, on a couple of our, our goals for last season when it came to making playoffs, because if you looked at the first half of our season in conference, I think we'd set ourselves up to potentially finish fairly high in the conference. Um, we just failed to score when we needed to later in the year against opponents that we felt we probably should have uh, had a better outcome. So I, I will say overall, there was some exciting moments, um, but also, you know, some moments that we, we knew we, we would like to have back. So I think we've got a, a hunger in our guys because of last year and year two. And I think um, having my first freshman class come in, I think we're, we're looking, regardless of our season being shortened, I think we're looking forward to, to what these 11 games will bring for us. You know, uh, Ryan, we had, we had uh, coach Fano on, uh, last week and I asked him this same question and you know usually as as the head coach the first year is pretty tough you know you're, you're you're adjusting to you know everything that you just talked about and then progressively every year gets a little bit easier but there's no way that year two could have been easy for you in that uh everything has just been so crazy you know you should be you know in the in the playoff run of uh, of your schedule and here uh, on Saturday you'll actually just start your season how has it been how big of an adjustment has it been just uh, from a coaching standpoint, preparing guys for an 11 game season rather than a 25 game season? Yeah, it's been difficult and it's been more difficult because we just don't have the face time and the, and the team time with our group that we would have in a normal year. You know, we're not allowed to gather in large groups where if we do gather, it has to be in large spaces. So it takes some, uh, some of the, the closeness away from those conversations where you enjoy uh, having those conversations, but I, I think the guys are looking forward to it. I think they understand that there's an urgency. I think they understand that a, a seven game regular season basically means it's a seven game playoff um, with the unknown of what, is there going to be an NCAA tournament is there not and, and all those things and still some of those unknowns. But I think without being able to talk about it as much as we would have liked and prepare guys for it, I do think there's an internal preparation in our group that they understand um, what we have ahead of us and, and how important every game is, is going to be. So I, I like where our group is at. I think we were fortunate in the first half of the season to get those six or five and a half or six weeks of practice in. And a good chunk of those were as a full group, not knowing if we were going to play games at all. Um, and I, I thought we got a lot out of those practices. Now we're back for second semester and we're not as a full group. We're in small groups and 
it's difficult to to work on things that you want to spend time on, but we're still finding ways to get better every day. So we're excited. You know, Ryan, I hope you don't mind me asking this question because we just talked about this uh, prior to prior to uh, uh, the Cardinals nest and talk a little bit about about some of the adjustments you've had to make just from a a standpoint of making sure that you guys stay healthy. I mean, you, you joked a little bit that you've got a stopwatch that you use as guys go into the locker room. Just talk a little bit about all the adjustments that have had to be made just so that you guys could even, even attempt to get a season in this year. Yeah. So we had to take the standpoint of just, if you were to pick a player on our roster and for some reason that player were to test positive, how would that positive affect the rest of the team based on how we were engaging each other in the locker room, how we were practicing on the ice, what our group size looked like, and, and what we might have available to us to play games if we were to have a positive test. So right now, based on CDC or the Minnesota Department of Health, MDH, it, 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 we can only spend so much time in the locker room. Um, we have to make sure that if one positive test were to occur, we have enough players to play a game. So we're actually broken down into three pods, um, which isn't ideal. So we're getting shorter practice but we're getting more reps with less bodies um and that's really been the extent we, we as coaches we don't go in the locker room um not at this point in time it's just one of those things where we don't want to put ourselves at risk if there were to be a positive test because if if one of our staff members were to be exposed you would probably be able to say that all three of us were exposed we spend a lot of time together the three of us and planning and and working towards games and different things. So there's been a lot of adjustments we've had to make, but I can tell you our guys have done a really good job of understanding why we're doing it. And the biggest fear you have as a coach is, you know, does the, does the mentality in the room turn negative? Does it turn into a negative atmosphere where it's, it's complain about this and it's complain about that? I can tell you, we don't have that in our room right now, regardless of the, the protocols that we as a staff have put in place. They know that it's in the best interest of our group and it's in the best interest of having success and getting in all 11 games, or at least they know it's not going to be on us if some, something bad were to happen. We're going to be prepared for whatever comes at us. Ryan, do you think that, um, you know, since all of the teams are basically um, sort of in the same position as far as the social distancing and all of that goes, could you look at it as the team that handles this the best mentally will have sort of a, an advantage uh, come competition day? I think it's very fair. And I think that's a lot of the message that we're trying to send to our group is the, the physical part of it and the, and the mental part of it when it comes to preparing for a game tactically is one piece. The, the attitude of our group and the camaraderie of our group because of what we're going through, the group that deals with it the best, I think is definitely gonna have, have more success. So I think it's a very fair statement. I think it's very accurate. And uh, I think we're all gonna learn a lot as coaches and as players and we're going to learn a lot about us, ourselves as we work through this process. Brian, talk a little bit about, about this year's team. What, uh, you know, what do you really like about this year's team? And, and unfortunately, you have to ask the question too, what is there? Is there a, a, a bit of a weakness that you see that, uh, that maybe you guys need to really focus on as you get ready for Saturday's season opener? Yeah, I think if we take it one position at a time, I think you know, one area where we think is our strength right now is obviously offensively. Return Tommy Stang, we return Ryan Stoinich. I think in our freshman group, we've we've recruited some players that offensively are going to have the ability to help us right away. Um, and I also I like the fact that we recruited some players that are going to help us on special teams, both penalty kill and and on the power play. Defensively, you know what? We, we lost Kyle Knee. That's going to be tough to replace. So we're going to look to the Kyle Wilhelms of the world, and we're going to look to. Uh, you know, a Noah Kimo who we brought in as a freshman and a transfer student, um, Andrew Fraze is going to have to play a big role. Um, you know, Sam Schultz being a, a senior is going to have to step up. So I think there might be some question marks there just in how we react to not having Kyle Nee, who played 30 minutes a night for us and offensively was a gifted defenseman that, that produced um, more than a lot of our forwards did. So that's going to be an area that we're going to be very attentive to and, and see how that works out. And then the other area is goaltending. Um, it's been no secret um, when it comes to me communicating with my goalies that I thought we could have been better in that last year than we were at times. Um, they've both our senior goalies have been challenged with what the expectation is this year. Um, and then we recruited a goaltender, freshman goaltender 
to uh, to Connor Close to come in and challenge both of our seniors, and we expect him to do that. So goaltending is an area that uh, is another area where we're, I, I think, I wouldn't say we have question marks, but I think there's going to be a lot of competition for that, for that space. Um, but we like the freshmen we brought in. We think they complement the upperclassmen that we have. I think you're going to start to see my brand of hockey unfold a little bit more this year. I mean, we added almost two inches on average to our height of our team and almost 15 pounds in weight. So, which was our goal in our freshman class. And I think we achieved both. So at 5'8", 150, I probably wouldn't have been recruited. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you would have had to be highly skilled. Um, I, I like the skill set of our team. We just needed to be heavier and we weren't winning battles net front and in, in some of the gray, dirty areas of the rink that we felt we should be winning more consistently. Part of that is just being a little heavier on our sticks and having a little heavier bodies to come out on the right end of those, of those uh, battles. Ryan, as you look back on last year and, and really into this year, what's, what's the biggest difference between coaching a junior team and, uh, and coaching a Division three college team? Uh, that's, that's, a good, that's a good question, Donnie. I, I think, you know, the biggest thing is really how you how you go about daily business I mean when you when you're coaching junior hockey it's hockey 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 there's no real academic piece to it at that point in time for those athletes so you have to consider the fact that our athletes are just dealing with a lot more in their daily life than what the junior hockey player is so I can expect more physically and mentally from my, my junior hockey players on the rink than I can necessarily from the college hockey players that practice in at four 30 and six 30 at night, they've already had a full day and they've already had a, a lot that's gone on in their world from a test to a homework, to writing a paper and, and managing those expectations between the two, I think is one, is one of the bigger differences. Um, you know, one thing we've always said is, you know, junior hockey is a, is a physical demand, very physically demanding. It's a 60 plus game schedule. Well, college is a very mentally demanding piece of their life. So we have to manage that mental piece. Of it a little bit more. Ryan, I'm curious to know, uh, without giving away any uh, uh, secrets, of course, or your plan, how will this year be different from a strategy standpoint, um, given the shortened season and just uh, some of the, 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 the sort of series differences that, that you'll face this year? Um, I, I don't see strategy changing a, a, a ton in, in necessarily how we play the game. I think what what we're going to have to adapt to is, for example, our power play is going to get to spend zero time on the ice together. So they're going to have to adapt come game day. So we're kind of going with the how are we going to adapt, and we call it less is more. So we're going to have less practice time on thir certain things. Is that going to be beneficial to us? So that's kind of a question mark for us. Moving forward, are we going to learn from this experience and say, okay, we didn't spend much time on that, but maybe we had more success at it because of it. So those are some things that we're working on to see if that's, if how we're doing things now, is it better than maybe how we were doing things in the past and how are we gonna do them moving forward? And then earlier, Ryan, you had brought up um, the fact that when you look back at last year, you know, you felt like maybe there were some outcomes that should have been a little bit differently. I was digging through some of Donnie's stats and I saw that in the last two seasons, there were 20 games that either went into overtime or were settled by one goal or less, right? And I know a lot of those were last year. And, and I think that's kind of what you were referring to earlier. What makes the difference in, in kind of pulling out some of those one goal overtime types of games? What does it usually come down to, do you think? I think for me, two major areas is, is one is special teams. Um, we've got to do a better job on the PK in certain areas and then power play. We've got to take advantage of our power plays. Th those two factors are carrying ever more um, weight on the outcomes of games because the penalty minutes just continue to go up as they continue to manage the game. Um, and then the other piece I think to that is, is goaltending. I think we have to expect more of our goaltenders. I think our goaltenders need to expect more of themselves. And, and those are the two, two biggest factors, I think, right now in those one goal games, because I like our brand of hockey. And I thought we, you know, there were times where we outplayed our opponent badly last year and still found ways to lose. Um, and, and when we found ways to lose some of those games, I put it on, on, on special teams mostly, and then potentially a, a goal that we gave up late in the game that maybe I didn't think we should have let up. Okay. 
Brian, one of the big changes this year, um, overtime is going to be three on three rather than five on five. Uh, talk a little bit about that, your opinion of it. Uh, what do you think of that? And, uh, and how will it really change, uh, change the overtime? Yeah, I, I go back and forth. I, I like the three on three overtime piece. I don't dislike it, but I do like the five on five piece before the three on three. I, I like how in our conference in, in the years past, it's been five on five to play for all three points. This year with the three on three, the challenge with it isn't necessarily a three on three. The challenge is we're going to finish in a tie. So we're not going to go into a shootout and have an outright winner for that game. Um, that with the shortened amount of games that we play, it would be unfortunate to come out of the season going through the whole game and end up with four ties. You know, nobody wants to tie. So that would be my my biggest. I, it's not even a frustration. I just that's the one thing that I that I maybe worry about the most is is how many ties are going to become. Uh, is it going to become a factor as we move forward? So I just like the fact that we play to a winner in the past. So we'll see how that works out. But the three on three is exciting. I like it. I think our guys enjoy it. Especially they enjoy it when we got to work on it in practice because it's fun for them. Well, speaking of practice, and I've been, you know, I've been doing a, a little senior special, a senior spotlight all through the year. And one of the questions on there is your favorite coach moment or coach yeah. story. And I tell you, a lot of your seniors' answers were learning about lucky. <laughs> and so I think, and I know I asked you this last year, but I think you have to re explain what exactly lucky is because. I don't think people are lucky uh, when they experience <laughs> Coach Egan's lucky. Yeah, we spend a lot of time talking about luckies too. Um, it's something through junior hockey that, that I developed, and it's, it was basically another level of accountability. Everyone likes to talk about you know, the conditioning piece as being a punishment all the time. Well, I don't necessarily call it a punishment. I call it just being accountable. But a lucky itself is goal line to goal line three times in under 55 seconds. And as we progress throughout the year, we challenge our group to get less time. So maybe under 50 or maybe under 48. And we want it to be an individual challenge for guys too. And we've talked about having a, a, a lucky leadership or a leaderboard in our locker room over time, right? So guys can challenge themselves. But over the, over the course of a year, as we do luckies, it's not, it's not a fun thing. They don't enjoy it. And it's not even, it's not meant to be enjoyed. It is meant to be challenging. It is meant as, as another level of accountability. And um, whether we do two luckies or we do four luckies, um, the guys don't get excited about it, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Donnie, it sounds to me like I'm lucky I don't have to I do think, that. I think you, you and me both, Dean. You and me both. <laughs> uh, and I will say it, it, you know, it has taken its own identity here since I've been here. Um, and if that's what I'm known for, you know, down the road, I guess at least it's good to be known to be remembered for something. I'll say that. Say, Ryan, before we ask you some uh, more lighthearted uh, questions, um, I, I do have, I want to say, I, I do feel lucky that I follow uh, the St. Mary's men's hockey social media accounts. And one of the things I really enjoyed last year, and it seems to be a very cognizant effort on your part, is to get some alumni uh, to come into the locker room before games and kind of read off the lineups. Maybe uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, when I when I started here, I knew, you know, we, we wanted to, or it was a goal of mine, is to engage our alumni as much as we could and to find creative ways to do that and get them in front of our group. In hockey, the lineup in the locker room because become a big deal and in different teams at different levels do it different ways. And I thought this was a good way to engage our alums. Having them into the room, being able to tell a story, being able to share with them any thoughts that they have about, uh, about the game or about their, the memories they have of wearing the same sweater. Um, I don't think as a program, we can be as successful as we want to be without having the alums involved in what we're doing and having our guys understand how many guys or how many people came before you to get the program to this point. So we've tried to be creative in engaging the alums. That's just one way. Um, this year, we're trying to get even more creative with it. We've invited our alums to participate, um, technically only in home games, because we have the technology to FaceTime our alums right into the room or Zoom them right into the room. So we're hoping that some of the alums will take advantage of that and continue with that tradition, even in a time of COVID. 
Um, I haven't had any alums jump on it yet, but I, I'm hoping by Saturday we'll have someone step up and get involved in that. Cause I think even on zoom or on a FaceTime, it still can be a beneficial experience for all. I tell you, Dean, from a, from a person who, who had the opportunity to speak in the locker room, it's, it's not, I mean, it, as neat as it is for the players, it's pretty cool for the alums too. I mean, uh, you know, I, I know as a hockey alum, there's always great stories to tell. And, and uh, you know, for, for, for me, it was, it, was, it was awesome. And just to have those guys, you, you have their attention and probably just because they want to know who the lineup is, but uh, you have their attention for that, you know, for that two or three minutes. And, and it is pretty special. And, uh, and something that I think that, that Ryan's right, I think our alums um, take great pride in the opportunity they get to be able to do that. Yeah, we've had alums bring their kids into the locker room and help them do it. It's a, it's a, it's a great experience for them to do it with their, with their sons or daughters at that point in time. We've had older alums. We've had younger alums. It's, it's been a lot of fun for me. I hope not more fun for me than for our guys, but I've really enjoyed it, and I hope they have too. Well, Ryan, my next. All right, Ryan. My, my go, next go ahead, question Danny. Was going to be, um, you know, in in year one, what was your favorite uh, coaching moment? But then all you have to do is look over your right shoulder and and know exactly uh, what that moment was, uh, and that is the trip out east. Talk just real quickly about the trip itself, because that's the wrong way. Your right shoulder is over here. Talk a little <laughs> bit. Of, talk a little bit about the trip and and the importance of it, because really, when you went over there you guys were like the afterthought of the four team tournament. You know, you were supposed to be the, 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 the team that everybody kind of mopped up on. And yet you, you take two nationally ranked teams and, and take them to the woodshed and bring home a trophy. Uh, that says a lot about, about West region hockey and, and really St. Mary's in general too. No, it does. And I, we were excited for it. We really tried to make the trip as, as much of an experience as we could. And part of it was the decision to take a bus rather than to fly wasn't an easy decision, but I think in the end, it was the right decision. We got a lot of, spend a lot of time as a group over two days busing out there and two days busing back. And the experiences we had on the way out going to Niagara Falls and stopping at the University of Michigan and skating in their facility, it, it really allowed us to understand our group a little bit better. And it developed what, what Coach Reska likes to say, that chip on our guy's shoulders. They, they knew it was going to be a challenge out there, but they developed, they developed that chip on their shoulder, knowing that we were going to play against three ranked teams and we had something to prove. I think we all knew that we were maybe even better than what we had played to that point in the season. And this was going to be experience where we could go out and play good teams and, and make a splash. And our guys prepared, like I've never seen a team prepare before. Um, they, 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 we had some specific things put in place tactically that they wrapped their arms around and benefited us as simple as how we change lines on the fly. You know, we practiced it for a week. They, they worked on it. They took it to heart. They spent the time in the hotels doing the right things to prepare. And we were fortunate enough to come out with a great outcome. Um, on the way back, we stopped at, uh, you know, John McDonough had invited us to a Chicago Blackhawks game. Um, so we ended up taking care of a couple suites and tickets and food and the whole, the whole shebang for us. And it just ended up being a really, really great memory for the guys. And I, I feel very blessed that we were able to, to accomplish that in our first year, in my first year with this program. I think it was a good launching point to, to I think, hopefully where we're headed. All right. Well, Donnie, we'll uh, kind of start in with uh, a few questions now that are a little bit more intended to be lighthearted and just a chance to get to to know our men's hockey coach, Ryan Egan, a little bit better. So, Donnie, I'll let you go ahead and get well, started. The, the simple one to me, Eags, is, is if you had one person that you could sit down and talk hockey with, who would you like that to be? You know, I, I haven't read a lot of books in my day. Um, but I did in early in my coaching career, I read a lot of books, um, about Scotty Bowman. And I think he's had a lot of success in the game. And I think the way he approached the game is intriguing and his knowledge. So I could probably list off five or 10. If I had to choose one off the top of my head, I don't think that'd be a bad one. I think Scotty Bowman would be a, a, good, a great conversation. Now, Ryan, as you know, when I webcast games, I get there early, I get set up, and so I get to listen to all of that uh, pregame music uh, that, uh, that they play in the rink as the, the teams are warming up. 
if you would get to choose the pregame music, what, what artists might appear on there more than more than once? Uh, well, I'd like to get more control over the music that's played before games. <laughs> I have a um, feeling I'd like if you that. got more control. Over yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that would be a good thing. Um, you know, if I look back on, on, it would be like ACDC, would probably what you'd hear the most. I think. Mm -hmm. All right, that's I great. Think I might be, get, I'd I like might to be get aging all of us a little bit there, but I think that would be uh, a good place for it. I'd like to get control of the volume and maybe turn it down just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the volume is an issue. And then just acoustically, the sound bounces off places in that rink that uh, are a little different from some places. All right. You mentioned, you mentioned your, your assistant coaches. So if, if Coach Reska and Coach Elliott competed in a decathlon against each other, who'd win? Well, we're going to go with the age factor there, and I would have to say Coach Elliott, just for the fact I think he's got a few years on Coach Resco. All right, I'm going to ask one more, and then Donnie will get the final question before we have to sign off. Uh, Ryan, if you could play any other sport, what would it be? Oh, for sure, soccer. I mean, I, I, I coached a little high school soccer when I was student teaching um, in the fall uh, through college, and I love it. I love it still to this day. Uh, my family, we're big Tottenham fans. Um, so we watch as much English Premier League soccer as we can. And I think there's a very, there's a lot of similarities between soccer and hockey. And I would say in the sports world, by far my, my second love, real close to hockey there. And, and I remember chatting with you on a lacrosse youth soccer field when our kids were, were both playing. Yeah. So. <laughs> yep, yep. My kids get it from me about soccer as much as they do about hockey. All right, good, good. <laughs> yeah. Well, real simple one to end with, Ryan. Kansas City Chiefs or Tampa Bay Buccaneers? You know, it's – I don't watch a lot of NFL football. I, I would probably – I'm intrigued to see Tom Brady do it in a different uniform, I'll be honest. I think it would be a huge feat if he can do it in Tampa after having left the dynasty that he left up in the Northeast. So I'm going to have to go with Tom Brady with experience on that one, but I do think it could go either way. All right, Ryan Egan, men's hockey. Thanks for being on the Cardinals nest and Hey, good luck as you get started this weekend here. I appreciate it guys. Thank you. Thanks. Ryan. All right. That's going to do it for the Cardinals nest. Thanks for watching.